Hi. This week's story from church history is taken from a book entitled Ten Girls Who Didn't Give In. Today's story is about a girl or a woman named Blandina, and she lived in what is present-day France in a area known as Lyon in France. Uh, back before um, when she lived there, it would have been known as Gaul. It was taken over by the Romans uh, before Jesus was born. Uh, this story uh, of Glandina takes place probably about 150 years after the time of Christ. So let's begin with our story. Two girls stood together at the well with their mother. She was waiting to draw water for her mistress. And the children were there because they were still too small to work. Run and play while I draw the water, the woman said, because we'll have to, to get home quickly as soon as I've had my turn at the well. Blandina touched her friend on the arm. Tag, she said, and then ran off. The other child recognized the game immediately, though she wasn't the best pleased that Blandina wanted to play tag. It's no fun chasing someone who can't run nearly as fast as you, she thought. I could catch her every time, and sometimes I need to slow down and pretend I can't run any faster. But having grumped to herself, the girl immediately perked up and played the game. After all, it wasn't every day that the children of slaves were free to have a runabout. It's my turn next, Splendina's mother shouted to the girls. Watch, watch to see when I've drawn the water and be ready to come right away. The woman in front of her filled two wooden pails with water, then staggered off under the weight of them. Blandina's mother, who was a strong and healthy young woman, filled her pails in no time. And when she lowered the second one to the ground, the girls were right there beside her. You are good, the pair of you, said the slave woman. One of the other mothers had to go and look for her son and then drag him back home. Now off you go. It was quite a long walk from, from the well, and the sun was beating down on them. I wish it wasn't so hot, said Blandina. I'm going to melt into a little grease spot on the ground. Her mother smiled and thought of something interested to, interesting to the tell the children to stop them the slowing down. Did you know that there are parts of the Roman Empire that aren't or that are much hotter than it is here in Lyon? That the Gaul, that's modern day France, is in between the hot Roman Empire and the cold Roman Empire. Where's the coolest? Blandina asked. Well, said your mother, your father was talking to some soldiers who were passing through Lyon on their way to Rome. That was where their home is. They had been serving the emperor in the north of England, and they said it was cold there and that it had rained nearly all the time. Why does the emperor put his soldiers as far away as that? queried the child. Apparently, he had been building a wall right across England to show the people who was in charge. And where's the hottest part of the empire? the other girl asked. They were nearly home now and almost running in case they were seen and thought to be slacking. I thought that would be Rome itself, said the slave woman. I've heard it's, it's fearfully hot place in the summer. As soon as they went into the courtyard, the children disappeared as though they had indeed melted into grease spots on the ground. Slave children learned to be disappearing acts. It was the best way to keep out of trouble. I'm worried about Blandina, her mother said that night, when the girl was sound asleep. Do you think she's a healthy child? Her husband looked concerned. She seems healthy, healthy enough, but she's not what I'd call strong. Although she tries hard, she does run out of energy before other girls her age. But that's probably because she's smaller than they are. I'm worried that she won't grow, said the woman. There's no place in this hard world for a slave girl who can't pull her weight when there's work to be done. Worry, you're worrying too soon, her husband decided. She'll put on height, and then she'll strengthen up. You wait and see. She's not even what you'd call um, a pretty girl, said the woman, who was in a mood for sharing her troubles. But her as, as her husband was not in a mood for listening, 
that was far from the as far as the conversation went. Landina's mother did wait, but she did not see very much of a difference. True, her daughter grew, but she grew into a spindly sort of a girl. She was very willing to work, and so far her owner didn't seem to have noticed that she didn't have much muscle about her. That was a comfort to her mother, but it didn't stop her from worrying. Now listen to me, she told Landina, when she was beginning to grow up. When the mistress is around, always, always be busy. Don't ever be seen standing doing nothing. I know you sometimes feel worn out and need a rest, but just be sure you take your rest out of sight of the mistress. She won't want to buy food for a slave that's not earning her keep. Advice like that was necessary in those days, but it had the effect of making Blandina feel nervous and on edge. She kept watching to the side and behind her just to make sure that she was working hard enough when she was within sight of anyone who mattered. By the time Blandina was almost an adult, she was a servant slave to a Christian woman. We don't know how that came about, but could it have been that the woman felt sorry for the girl? She's a timid girl and not strong, the Christian lady told her sister. But have you looked at her face? It's not a handsome face, but she has character. Then, as an afterthought, she added, she has a kind of strength of character that you don't see in many girls her age. Was it through working for a Christian that Blandina was converted? We don't know. But we do know that while she was still in her teens, she learned about the Lord Jesus Christ and became one of his followers. When she was able to meet with the other Christians in, in Lyon, her mistress was a, also one of the congregation. It was during one of these meetings that Blandina caught her mistress's eye, and a smile went between them that the girl thought she would always remember. One of the men was reading God's word. She told another slave girl as she started down to settle down to sleep that night. He read wonderful words that I've never heard before. He said that those who are followers of Jesus are all alike in his eyes. That God doesn't see Jews different from Greeks or men different from women. Her friend's eyes were closing with exhaustion, but Blandina nudged her to hear the best part of all. But the girl was shocked into a total wakefulness by what Blandina said next. And he said that God doesn't see slaves any different from people who are free. Do you believe that? Her friend asked. I do, said Blandina. And I'm sure that the mistress believes it too. For when the preacher said it, he looked round at me and she smiled. Tell Blandina to come and help me the mistress told one of her slaves. She does things how I want them done. As time passed, this happened more and more often, until the two women were in each other's company quite a lot of the time. Sometimes the older woman even read from the Bible to her slave. Yet, more surprising, there were times when her mistress asked Blandina to pray for her. The first time that happened, the girl almost jumped in surprise, and perhaps in fear. Things that were out of the ordinary could still make the young woman feel nervous. These are troubled times, the preacher told his congregation one Sunday. The emperor, Marcus Aurelius, has no time for Christians. Since he became emperor, that's in 161 AD, vicious things have happened to believers. I have news for you, brothers and sisters. The noose is tightening around Lyon. I believe that the persecutions are coming here and that some of you might even have to die for our Lord. On hearing what he said, Blandina's first reaction was to enjoy the warm feeling that she always experienced when the preacher called the congregation brothers and sisters. She was a slave away from her family, but the little church in Lyon was her family in a very real way. Then the rest of the message sank into her head. Some of you might even have to die for our Lord. 
Looking round the congregation, she saw fine, tall, strong young men, most of them slaves like herself, and she wondered if they would be first to be rounded up and tried. But why should they be, she asked herself as she walked home alone. The Roman soldiers could arrest me as easily as them. Then she stopped in her tracks. My mistress. Surely they'll not arrest my mistress. Surely they'll only take the slaves. When the whole force of Marcus Aurelius's anger was unleashed, he didn't care whether Christians were slaves or free. He just wanted them killed in the most horrific and horrible and public ways possible. We must pray for each other, you and I, her mistress told Blandina. When news of terrible happenings reached them, we're sisters in Christ, and we must help each other as best we can. Blenda lo Blendina looked at her mistress. How strong are you? She thought admiringly, and how brave. If the soldiers arrested you, you would walk into prison with your head held high. And looking at her servant, the woman thought just the opposite. What a frail young woman you are. And I wonder how you'll cope when we're arrested. And I'm sure we will be. I'll do everything I can for you, she thought. The emperor's anger raged hot and was centered and centered itself on Lyon. Roman soldiers did a great sweep of Christians and many, including Blandina and her mistress, were thrown into prison. In her cell, the young woman looked even more frail and more nervous than she did at home. Pray for Blandina, her mistress whispered to the other Christians one at a time. Pray that God will give her the courage to bear what's going to happen. Pray that she'll not deny the Lord Jesus just to be set free. The next morning, the prison guard barged in and went to drag Blandina out to trial. But she didn't need to be dragged. She went willingly, with her head held high. All day the prisoners wondered what was happening to her. They were amazed when they heard the news. Blandina had endured so much torture that her torturers had given up in exhaustion. My dear child, her mistress said when the young woman's broken body was returned to the cell overnight. My dearest child. Her loving words were like cool water to Blandina, who fell asleep in her arms. The following day, the same thing happened. The slave girl was taken from the cell and accused of terrible things. I am a Christian, she said over and over again, and we've done e nothing evil. Her torture went on all day. Once again, she was returned to the cell where her mistress waited to soothe her wounds and pray with her. That following day, Blandina was taken to the amphitheater with three other Christians to be fed to the wild beasts. Now, an amphitheater would be a great big um, building without a roof on it, and thousands of people would be able to sit around and look down upon things that were happening down below. Those left in the cells prayed as they'd never prayed before. At first, the beast didn't go in Blandina's direction. But eventually, her tormentors were satisfied she was dead. What they didn't know was that the one they had just killed was alive in heaven, and happier at that very moment than she'd ever been on earth. The number of Christians meeting to worship God the following Sunday was much smaller than it had been the previous week. Brothers and sisters, the preacher said, this has been a terrible and a wonderful week for us. We have seen many of our members pass from death to glory, and that is both terrible and wonderful. Not only that, we have seen an example of such Christian courage as will be remembered a thousand years from now. Our little sister, the timid and weak Blandina, showed herself to have courage and strength that could only have come from the Lord. In her death, she was an example to us that one day we may need to follow. If she, or if we should be called on the, to be martyrs for Jesus, may we be just like our sister Blandina. Amen. 
and amen, said every single person there. It is over 1,800 years since Glendina died, rather than deny her savior. Her name is to be found in just a few pages of some very old books, but it is good to begin a new book with her story and to keep her name alive into the 21st century. Blendina might not have been as strong or as fast as the other girls, but that did not mean that God didn't want her. Even though she was weak physically, God gave her great strength so she could bear torture and not deny her Lord. This is still true. God doesn't always choose to use big, strong people. The Bible tells us that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And that's found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. It was not the custom for a slave, the slave's mistress to say anything to her except for instructions. However, Blendina's mistress did not behave that way because she knew that God did not see slaves and free people differently. The Bible tells us that we should not behave differently to rich or poor people either. And that's found in James chapter 1, verses, uh, James, sorry, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Think about how you can make sure that you do not show favoritism towards the people you meet. 